Mm, it's taking a sweet time today. All right, welcome back to the second half of our transcription and translation lesson, where we take the second component of protein synthesis into heart, and we look at the translation process. So now we're gonna look at translating, translating that messenger RNA into something functional and useful that the cell can use. So recall, the genetic code is quite robust, but there are only four possible bases within DNA and RNA as well, but there are 20 amino acids. So how do we rectify and, and um, connect those two concepts? Because each group of three nucleotides codes for a single amino acid. These are called codons. So those codons in a group of three code for one specific nucleotide and that's for one specific amino acid. So codons are read by ribosomes in the five prime to three prime direction of mRNA. So you might be thinking to yourself, huh, five prime to three prime. This is not making new DNA or making new mRNA. This is reading, reading that information. And ribosomes read that information five prime to three prime. So that's an important distinction to recognize when comparing DNA uh, replication as well as RNA creation from separating that from the idea of translation where ribosomes read it in the five prime to three prime direction. There are 64 possible codons, four to the exponent of three. Multiple codons for each amino acid though, okay? That there's gonna be some redundancies. When we look at the uh, codon component to the base codon specifically with regards to the amino acids, uh, there's going to be some redundancies in that. So the start codon, or the AUG start sequence, is a sense codon that codes for the amino acid methanonine. And this methanonine uh, is the codon that signals the start of translation. So it's going to, when that ribosome attaches on to that AUG sense codon, uh, that codes for methanonine, it's going to say, okay, it's time to start the translation process from this, much like the Tata box that we learned in transcription. Um, it, this is very similar in that sense because that methanonine or that AUG sense codon is gonna tell that ribosome, start translating here. So what does this entail? Well, because we have that start codon, we also need to have a stop codon. We need somewhere for the ribosome to read and say, okay, it's time to stop translating this messenger RNA and stop reading this information. So the remaining three codons um, that are left in terms of the amount of codons that are responsible for uh, stopping, there's three of them, the UAA, UAG, and UGA. They do not code for a specific amino acid like the AUG sense codon. However, they signal the end of translation and are therefore called nonsense codons. There's no amino acid added in this part. That AUG sense codon adds that methanonine, whereas the stop codon does not add an amino acid. It just is a nonsense codon. It tells that translation process to stop. So here I have the chart of all the codons that are responsible for amino acids and how they work. And the specific amino acids that are uh, abbreviated to the left are talked about to the right. So what we now see here is the highlighted stop codons and start codons in red and green. And everything else in between is responsible for a specific amino acid. So for example, just picking one randomly, uh, let's take a look at these codons here, the AAU, AAC, AAA, and AAG. AAU and AAC code for ASN. So when we look over on this chart here, okay, ASN, 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 bam, asparagine. That's the amino acid asparagine. And then AAA, AAG, they code for LYS, which is lysine. And that's the necessary amino acid that's coded by both of those two codons. Now you'll see them show up a few other places as well. But ultimately, ultimately, 
the codons are going to really be responsible for a specific group, and there's usually only two of them. Um, there are some special cases, but I, I don't get into that in this course. Uh, so looking at how this actually works now, the general idea of how we've turned this DNA into messenger RNA and what it allows for, we can start to see the connection from DNA all the way up to protein, which again, that's the big idea of the uh, of that uh, the central dogma of biology, that DNA to mRNA to protein. So I have my DNA strand, three prime to five prime from left to right, reading as TAC, CAA, TTG, AAA, CTG, and ATC. I know what the mRNA is going to be. And because I know what the mRNA is going to be, I can also determine what those amino acids are going to be. Oh, that was too quick but I did that separately. Okay, so the mRNA sequence, mRNA sequence. We have AUG, GUU, AAC, UUU, GAC, UAG. Again, reading from five prime, anti-parallel, five prime to three prime from left to right. This is the transcription phase, right? Five prime to three prime by RNA polymerase, and that's how it is transcripted. But now when we look at the amino acid sequence, recall that we're reading from five to three prime, bam. So we're gonna go from left to right. The translation is five prime to three prime, mRNA, but the polypeptide does not have a five prime or three prime N. This is because there are no sugars. This is a crucial component and why I refer to it above. There's no Ns, five prime or three prime Ns, because those are now amino acids that are highlighted here. They function as a protein eventually. And we'll look at that structure as we go. Because when we look at each of these, I'll highlight them in a different color. When we look at each of these codons, they correspond to a specific amino acid in the chart above. So we can see that AUG, that AUG is gonna be our start codon. Okay, sweet, that's where things get kicked off, bam. That GUU, GUU, find GUU on that chart. Boom. And then keep going and you'll be able to determine the exact amino acids that get connected in the exact order that those messenger RNA codons transcribed from that DNA will tell us. So the steps of DNA to mRNA to protein uh, DNA transcription to mRNA, and then mRNA translation into amino acids and ultimately proteins is what allows for that central dogma to, to ring true and, and what allows for those proteins to function based on what the DNA tells it to. So now we're going to look at how that process actually works in, in, in pretty broad detail, but we look at some specifics. So we alluded to different types of RNA earlier, and now we're going to look at transfer RNA and what that function of transfer RNA is to allow for the it's to allow for those amino acids to essentially get translated. So at the tip of one segment of a transfer RNA is called an anticodon. This anticodon corresponds to a codon on that messenger RNA strand. It's complementary, right? Complementary, still RNA. And this anticodon determines the amino acid that the tRNA carries. This is crucial to our understanding of the process because every tRNA carries a very specific amino acid based on that anticodon that it has. So when you think about tRNA and the segment that is opposite end of that anticodon, it's carrying that amino acid that corresponds to the anticodon. So each tRNA is responsible for transferring one specific amino acid. So in this example of the diagram I have to the right, this ACC, that's the messenger RNA codon. When you look back at that chart, ACC is responsible for that THR amino acid or the threonine and that tRNA sequence, that tRNA sequence is going to be complementary to that codon or what we call an anticodon. So this tRNA molecule binds to the corresponding amino acid through a process called amino 
or silation, amino silation, oh, took a little struggle with the read there, amino silation, where tRNA binds to its amino acid, it forms an amino acyl tRNA connection, okay? So this energy in the amino acyl tRNA drives the formation of that peptide bond that links amino acid during translation. And the reason being is that recall, this is where we start to recall back into our, um, our biochemistry from unit one. Whenever we remove water, we can use that reaction to connect and bind amino acids. So that amino acid of this, this threonine, it gets attached on to the predecessor component of that amino acid chain as a result of the uh, biochemistry of each of the amino acids. So it forms that peptide bond, and that's what allows for that polymerization of that amino acid chain. So how does that all happen? What is the driving force of all of this? It is the ribosome. So the tRNAs fit into the ribosomes specifically, but the ribosome is kind of like the house that allows for, or the manufacturer facility that allows for that amino acid to be formed. So there are two ribosomal subunits, a small and a large one. And once in the cytosol, that messenger RNA strand threads between the small and large subunits here, where it is red while moving in a five prime to three prime direction. So appropriate amino acids can be added to the end of the growing polypeptide chain by tRNA. So look for that star codon, that AUG, to bring in that initial amino acid and then once that process starts, tRNA are going to come in to that ribosome, utilize that amino acid tRNA connection, connect that current amino acid that that tRNA is holding to the previous chain, utilizing that hydrolysis or the creation of water reaction to form that peptide bond between each of the amino acids. So it does that in three stages. Um, or sorry, uh, we'll get to those stages later. But the three sequential sites that we want to first look at in terms of the ribosome and tRNA uh, subunits are as followed. So the sequential sites are the amino acyl site, the location for the incoming tRNA with the complementary codon. So that's where it's going to recognize that complementary codon and attach that tRNA into that messenger RNA. The peptidal site, where the location of the peptide bond formation happens between the amino acid chain and the next amino acid that was brought in. That's that reaction that I alluded to above. And then the last site is the exit site where the tRNA will leave the E site after it has transferred that amino acid to that growing chain via that, again, that process that I described above with the amino acid tRNA. Okay, so let's look at the three main stages in translation. The first stage is initiation or initiation. The tRNA with the anticodon UAC which is the start codon of AUG that it recognizes, will form a complex with the small ribosomal subunit. This ribosomal subunit is going to have that complex formed at the P site, at the P site. The ribosome complex binds that five prime cap or where those seven guanines are. Remember I talked about that five prime cap in the last component of this uh, lesson where messenger RNA is, is formed. It adds that five prime cap of seven guanines on which in turn acts to find the ribosome a little bit better. So that messenger RNA uh, will bind to that site and then it's gonna move along, it's gonna move along and that ribosome is gonna continue moving and scanning until it reaches that first start codon. That first start codon will then be recognized by the anticodon of that MET tRNA or that methanoanine tRNA. And then that large ribosomal subunit will then bind to that tRNA small subunit and mRNA complex. So methanoanine should always be the first amino acid in any polypeptide chain. This is a big point for us uh, when I, again, I quiz you on the specifics of this on Monday. It's always gonna be the first amino acid in any polypeptide chain. Okay, last page folks, I promise. The next step of the uh, transcription or translation process, sorry, is elongation. This is gonna add amino acids to the polypeptide chain. So we have that large and small subunit. We have that initial start codon recognized. 
we have that methanoanine uh, tRNA attached on, now we can start forming that amino acid. So we have the initiation process completed. We're gonna, after that start codon has been recognized by that methano methanoanine tRNA, the rest of messenger RNA strand can then be read three bases at a time. It's very important that it's read three bases at a time because these are the codons that are responsible for creating the amino acid. This is, again, happens in the five prime to three prime direction. Elongation starts and as the elongation process goes on, it's gonna add the appropriate amino acids to that ribosome as they scan that mRNA. So when the next codon is read and whatever that codon is, it's gonna bring in that tRNA for the next codon or that next amino acid component and it's going to continue that process in the A, P to E in that order. So enzymes um, are gonna help with catalyzing these reactions. Uh, we don't go into the specifics with regards to it, uh, but recall, like, recognize that the enzyme peptidotransferase is gonna be responsible for helping to catalyze that, that uh, peptide bond. And then the last step is that the tRNA has now been catalyzed. The amino acid has been attached on to that chain into that P section. It now will again then get bumped into the E section of that ribosomal subunit, uh, simply because as that ribosome continues to read from left to right or five prime to three prime, it moves those tRNAs into the exit site once that amino acid has been added to that chain. And then it will return, it'll get bumped out through the exit site where it returns to the cytosol to pick up more amino acids that are corresponding to that anticodon. Okay, last step. Termination. When does termination occur? Again, the big idea here is that stop codon, right? The stop codon enters that A site. It is read by that ribosomal subunit, and it is stop codon for a reason. There's no amino acid that gets added onto that chain. The ribosomal subunit recognizes the stop codon, and a protein factor binds to that A site instead of tRNA. So that stop codon calls this protein release factor which then says, okay, polypeptide chain, you're done here, release from the tRNA at that P site. It's gonna cause the um, polypeptide chain to release. And since there isn't an amino acid in that A site, the freed polypeptide chain is detached from the ribosome unit as a whole. The small and large subunits disconnect from each other as well from the mRNA. They get rid of any excess tRNA that's uh, been attached to it with no amino acids attached. And then the release factor is also sent off into the wild. So this release factor blocks the A site, which effectively causes that release, okay? Which effectively causes that release. And lastly, I have this question here for you to think about as we end this lesson today. Do you think the polypeptide chain can act as a functional protein at this point? And the answer is not quite yet because the polypeptide chain only has that primary structure and it needs to fold and join other polypeptides to be functional, like the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. But what we have created now is a functioning polypeptide, assuming everything is translated and transcribed correctly, a functioning polypeptide, which then can fold now at secondary and tertiary levels into the structure of protein it needs to, and then form those uh, subunit structures with other proteins to create the overall protein that it needs to, to function within the cell. Okay, folks, big day, busy day, I recognize that. Uh, so I wanna make sure you have enough time to ask questions now. So we'll stop recording and we'll, we'll see what you got.